Hi, I'm Philip. I work for Elastic. I'm joined by my colleague Alex, who is waving in the background. Um, and he is on family duty as well. So that's why we will mostly keep him muted. Um, otherwise, you might encounter his daughter as well. So that's how we will dive into working from home. Challenges, challenges and tips and how that will progress here. So let me work that now. Um, so or actually, I don't like this view. Let's do it like this. Uh, before we start, um, whenever you write anything in the chat, please write to panel and attendees so that everybody can see what you're writing. Otherwise, um, we might lose whatever you're writing. Um, but feel free to, to stop us at any point in time. I'll talk a bit, but if you have any questions, just shout and we'll try to answer as we go along. So. There is this kind of joke in IT circles that some of us have basically prepared for this their entire life, that sitting at home, uh, working on their computer is what software developers were mostly made um, for, but it's actually not that easy. Um, while it's easy to joke about and assume that this is easy, it's not always that fun actually just to sit around at home, kind of isolated because it's a weird time and many of us didn't choose that way to work or we're not really prepared for it. So the point of this talk is to kind of show some things that we have learned over the time. So we both, Alex and me, work for Elastic as developer advocates. The company was founded a while back, I think eight years ago almost or so, and it was already founded in this work from anywhere mode because the four founders were not in the same city. And we have kept that model that we can work pretty much from wherever we want. And right now, this is a bit of a strength. And we want to share what we have learned or what is working and what is not working. So the first thing I want to point out is that it depends. It's something we say on a technical level a lot, but it depends also totally applies for working from home. Because many people will throw around some absolutes like this is what you must do to work successfully. Or this is what you can never do. And I'm very careful with that because many things work for some people or don't work for others. So I would be very careful to say, this is the only way how to approach something. You can learn from others what is working from them or what is not working, but don't treat it as absolutes that this is the only way how to approach something. So the it depends will totally apply for working from home because it will depend on yourself mostly, but also your company and your colleagues, how everybody can work together and work this out. Um, the other thing that is very important is that we are all trusted adults. So adults means you're responsible for yourself and your outcomes. So you know what you're doing and why you're doing it. And the trusted part is hopefully your company trusts you enough to do the right thing. So nobody has to monitor you all day around. If your company wants to install some software to track how much you're working, that is kind of a weird sign for me as well already. Um, it's more about the outcomes, but let's dive into kind of like where we want to get. Uh, so our VP of engineering, Kevin, always keeps saying, I don't really want to know what you're working on today or tomorrow. What I want to see are the outcomes and results in a week or in a month or long term. So it's not about the, what are you doing right now? Because nobody can get any work done if you continuously interrupt it and you try to bring this mentality to your home that somebody monitors what you're doing. But since we're trusted adults, it's about getting to the right results in the long run. So it's not about what you do right now, but more about the outcomes. And that leads us to some guiding principles. So generally working from home will bring advantages, which can be advantages or challenges. The first one is flexibility. It's not about going to the office, working from nine to five or maybe going in early to beat the commute. Flexibility is breaking up your work day into something that works for you and for your family and your company. So if you want to break it up into smaller chunks or if you want to have an extended lunch with your family or you work in the evening and in the morning, all of that should be fine. It shouldn't be like you need to work this specific set of hours. Um, it's more about doing the work in whatever way fits you and your family in complicated times. Um, the other thing is results over hours. We don't track how many hours we work. Generally, it's just about 
whatever outcome you can produce. Is it software artifacts you generate, webinars you can give right now, questions on this or stack overflow that you answer. It's more about the outcomes than spending eight hours a day at what you're doing. If you're very good at something and you're quicker than that, nobody will probably complain about that if you spend only five hours on that. Just don't waste your time and do the right thing. Um, the other thing, especially when you're working from home, is that writing everything down, especially around decisions, is definitely beating explaining something or training somebody. Because A, it will be much more scalable, but also it will be much easier to onboard other people. And you probably forget how you get got to a specific decision later on. So what you want to be able to do is you want to find out why something happened. So what we do, for example, a lot is when we make a decision of why we use a specific technology or approach or whatever, we write it down normally in the form of a GitHub issue. And that's where a decision is documented and anybody else can search for that and find that. And you can also go back there yourself afterwards to figure out how you got to a specific decision. And it's easy to share, it's easy to find, and everybody can benefit from that. Tying into that is generally communication should be public. So you should not be required to have some knowledge. It's just accessible. Not everybody has to know everything immediately, especially as you get bigger. But everybody should have the opportunity to find as much information publicly as possible. And Ideally, you can add information to that or at least add some comments to something. It should not be that you always need to request how to access something or you always need to ask for permissions and everything is as locked down as possible because it will create a lot of friction and also information will not be able to flow as freely as it probably should. We're pretty strong on the oversharing side and you might get kind of like lost on the buried of a mountain of information. But we see this as a big advantage that you can get all of the information that you need and figure out stuff on your own later on. Next up, asynchronous communication beats synchronous communication. If you can work out everything asynchronously, I guess if you're coming from an open source background, this is the natural way because pretty much everybody has been working from home anyway. And then you open a pull request, you discuss a pull request, you merge it. And that's how you work stuff out asynchronously. It's not always required to work something out in person directly, interrupting somebody else or being bottlenecked if you need more than two people that everybody is available at the same point in time. Since you're all at home already and you have kind of like lost a bit of the personal synchronous touch, do as much asynchronously that, as you can because that will make your life generally easier. There is from Dewey's, the makers of To Dewey's, they have a very nice blog post about asynchronous communication and how that basically allows you to go more into the so-called deeper work over the shallow work. Shallow work would be like it's busy work, but it doesn't produce the long-term outcomes that you want. It's answering emails immediately. It's answering everything on Slack. It's doing calls and status meetings. These are important and are relevant to sync up and keep everything going, but these are not the outcomes that you're working on in the long run. So the outcomes that you're normally interested, the deep work is something that you don't want to interrupt, interrupt and you need more focus and time. So if you work more in an asynchronous way, you can block out more time, focus more on deeper work and make that actually an advantage and not somebody will run by you in the office every now and then and interrupt you. Um, just block out the time, work in the asynchronous fashion and that will make your work balance hopefully easier. The other thing that is getting kind of tricky now that you have been working probably from an office for a long time and suddenly are thrown to work from home is to structure things kind of accordingly and gap the benefits of an office and working from home and making just everything work together. The first thing is probably have a dedicated workspace. If you can have a dedicated room where you can go, this will also come in handy for the life work balance that at some point you can leave that room and say, I'm done for today. This is outside of my work time now. If everything is in one place, some people have this, that they have a specific corner in the kitchen or so where they're working. And at some point they just close the laptop and then the working time is over. But as I said in the beginning, it always depends. So I must admit 
my workspace is kind of like all over the place and I don't have as much of a strict structure as some others want to. But for many people, it's, impo it's important to have this dedicated space where they do their work and then kind of like leave it. It's like commuting to and from your office, just commuting to a room or to a desk or whatever to make that work for you. And I already mentioned it, like life work balance. Um, some people prefer it the other way around, but I think in the end, what you want is life first and work second is even when you're home and you could work all day long, you should set the right boundaries and need to figure out what works for you. Some people will happily work 12 hours a day now. Others still want to keep the boundaries to spend more time with their family or not burn themselves out. So you just need to see what works for you and how you can balance those two out. If you're with your family at home, probably you're fine on the human interaction side. If you're all alone at home, probably you want to have some social interaction with your colleagues to compensate what you're missing out in the office. So I know that some people are very big on having like a coffee hour or whatever every day to just chat with their colleagues, not necessarily work related, but just to have that human interaction. Um, don't miss out on that. Otherwise you will sit there alone at home and you feel very isolated and lonely at some point. Um, Probably other of your colleagues have the same issue, so you can make that work for everybody and get the social interaction uh, for everybody. Or my friends and me, we had a, a Skype session yesterday where everybody was, most of us were playing poker together, but some were just hanging out. And I think we had a call between friends yesterday for two hours. So some kind of interaction outside of just work to make it work for you. Um, for some people, it's very important to keep the rhythm like get up at a specific time. Um, many people say it's very important for them to get dressed. So even though you could work in your pajamas all day long, it's very important to get dressed, to get into that feeling or mode of work. For others, it's less important. Again, this depends. It's something that you see again and again, that people recommend to get dressed. So I would probably try that out. Also, if you're used to your work schedule and you know I arrive at 9 a.m. at the office and we have a coffee break at 11 and we go for lunch at 1. Probably try to stick to that for now at least. Feel free to experiment but don't throw over all your habits. Just try to keep on with your habits where you can and then evolve them as you go along. Also some people feel it's necessary to actually block time on the calendar for lunch and set an alarm because otherwise they might forget. Maybe this is you then do that. Maybe this is not you. My lunch hours are all over the place. I don't care. But for some, it will be important to actually stick to a specific schedule. Even though you're at home now and you could do all that deep work, what is still very important is communication. And what is kind of important is that it's much more intentional now. When you're at the office, communication will kind of flow freely and people will just talk and it's more... I don't want to say accidental, but it just happens implicitly. When you're sitting at home, you need to work on communication more explicitly. So for example, what we do is, obviously we have meetings, though lots of meetings should have been an email and this, it applies to the office as well, but it especially also applies to when you're sitting at home because all of your colleagues are at home. Everybody can schedule a meeting. Everybody can join a meeting. You might do meetings all day long, but this is normally not what you want to do. So regular meeting rules still apply. Only have a meeting if there is an agenda and if the right people are there. Otherwise, make it an email, cancel it, reschedule it. Only do meetings when you need them. Um, what is important for us, at least in meetings, is well, if you can, always turn on the video and camera. Because just hearing somebody gives you some information, but seeing somebody gives you a lot more information. Like you can see the mimic, you can probably see a bit more the tone and the movement and just seeing a person uh, will add a lot more information than you would get in writing or just hearing the voice. So turning on videos is generally something we would highly recommend. Another concept that we have is called AON or always on, it's many teams have a dedicated video channel where there is streaming going on all day long and whoever wants to can just 
join and then see their colleagues. And if you have anything to say to everybody, you can just unmute and then you can discuss between two people or more people. This was kind of an interesting experience when I started working for Elastic four years ago. And the first day I was at home and I was a bit like, okay, now what, what do I do? Where is everybody? And then somebody said, said like, oh, hop on AON. And it was slightly confusing or weird at first because you jump on a channel and it's quiet, but you see 20 or so colleagues working. But it is kind of good to give you more of a connection to see that you're not totally alone. Your colleagues are working, everybody is there. If you need anybody, you can just ping them. It's a bit like the office feeling, but everybody from home. So if you can set up one of these AON channels and whoever feels like it will hop on that and just to not feel that isolation. Also, what is kind of good about that is if you have any kind of dispute or conflict, it often helps to help on video rather than send angry emails or write over Slack. Just like what I said before, that there is a lot of information missing in writing. And in a video, you can just pick up somebody's body language and tone much better. So oftentimes when something gets very heated over writing or in GitHub issues, it might be a good idea to quickly hop on a video call to calm things down and understand everybody better, which is often tricky in writing because you miss so much information that you often draw the wrong conclusions and then go off in the wrong direction. So video is an important tool here for us. Meeting structure wise is probably what you had anyway. And it's probably a good idea to keep that. So for example, we have every two or three weeks now, we have a company-wide call or broadcast. So this is mostly sending and you're receiving. Um, though what is helpful, because some people said like, this is not helpful at all because so many people cannot be in a video call. What is good is still you can see how something is being presented. And since it's synchronous, you can always jump in with questions. So even though only one person can speak at an all hands call with hundreds or more than a thousand people, everybody can still be on chat and just ask questions and then the presenter can answer stuff directly. And it's often our CEO or CFO explaining, I don't know, how did the last quarter go? How is this release going? What are the challenges on one specific project? It's something that is relevant to a wide audience. So the whole company should be in the know and whoever can join right now can join them. Otherwise make the recordings available. So whoever missed the call can still see that afterwards if they want to. On a smaller level, we have a team call with like 25 people or so. Though since we're globally distributed, not everybody will be able to join. So every now and then, we have a larger number on the call, but today we had a team call for 20 something or so that we are now. And today only seven could make it, but that's still fine. Discuss what you have to discuss and share the recording afterwards. And of course you still should or want to have your one-on-ones with your manager. So we normally schedule those every one to three weeks, depending on the person. Some people want more frequent feedback. Others are, with less feedback or they have a very busy manager then maybe you only want every two or three weeks but still have at least that 30 minute chat every now and then with your manager to, to get feedback to share ideas and also just generally to stay in touch and know how things are going otherwise you might be sitting at home feeling very isolated not knowing what is going on not knowing how well you're doing or how well a project is doing so it makes a lot of sense to actually stay in the know with your project manager for example what we also have is we don't do stand-ups, we don't do dailies. Um, we have a weekly email we call this week in community on our team. And this would be an example for my weekly email. So it goes to the entire team. We have one email subject this week in community TWIC, which is pretty easy to search for. And then I think the first day of the week for which this email is. And then we always have a three plus three structure. So you share three things from the past week that you have done and which are worth sharing and three things that you want to do in the next week that you also want to share. And this works very well for us to keep everybody in the loop. What are you up to and what is the progress? What, what are probably problems? What are you working on just to keep everybody in sync? 
And this would be pretty tedious in a synchronous way in a call. But in an email, it's very easy to actually share that every Friday or over the weekend or whatever you have the time. And everybody just jumps in and shares three points. It should be pretty quick to read and it should just include highlights. We generally try to avoid like busy work, like writing, I answered emails and did expense reports is normally not really worth sharing and not that relevant for most of the people. What is more relevant is like, what have you been doing or what will you be working on and especially stuff that will influence others or that others might be able to reuse or copy. So those are the things that are probably more interesting for you. If you're one of the more social people, then you probably want to use some tools to keep the social aspect of an office. So for example, we have water cooler, which is the random meeting place. I think water cooler is a bit of an American term maybe, um, but it's just the place where you would randomly meet in an office and can share whatever you want. Obviously that normally contains a lot of animated GIFs, but it just contains random stuff that people find entertaining or worth share, sharing. Also our team, for example, has a so-called community coffee, which is at varying times because of different time zones. If you're all in one time zone, it can probably be a fixed time when you would normally have your coffee at the office. We have that one, I think every two weeks um, where you can just hop on a call. It's not work related. It doesn't have an agenda. It's just to meet your colleagues, to chat about random stuff, maybe to show your pets because that seems to motivate a lot of people. Um, or just talk about non-work related stuff just to have this human interaction and have more of a team feeling to make that work for everyone. Tooling wise, because those are common questions are, if you can do everything asynchronously. So for example, for us, a lot of stuff is GitHub. It's everything is a GitHub issue or a pull request. You can also have a meta issue to structure things more or more complex tasks on GitHub. So Lots of things are a ticket and then a lot of stuff are emails, either direct emails or mailing lists. Most of us are subscribed to a ton of mailing lists. The nice thing about mailing lists or emails in general is that you can filter them very well. So even though you will get a lot of information and you can archive it automatically so you can actually search and find it later on, you don't have to actively read everything. And that is one of the main strengths, for example, for me, for email, what that I cannot really do on Slack that easily, that based on the specific word in the subject or the sender or the recipient or whatever, I can very easily filter information to my needs. And I think email is kind of like underrated for that. And as I've discussed before, asynchronous communication generally beats synchronous communication. So that's why we spend a lot of time in email. Sometimes, of course, you want synchronous communication, like the webinar or a general team meeting you probably want to do on a Zoom call or Slack for quick back and forth also makes a lot of sense. So those are tools, but use them the right way or sparingly or only when needed, basically. Um, Slack is generally what people have a love-hate relationship or I don't want to pick any product, whatever chat solution you're using, you probably have a love hate relationship with that. The rules that we basically have for Slack is don't make any decisions there. Decisions need to be documented somewhere else, either in email or for example, in GitHub so that everybody can find them and search them later on, because you will probably never find something on Slack again. And Slack is also a very bad log to find anything later on. They have search features, but it can be very tricky to actually find what you're looking for and it's just lost. And Slack threads are their own special problem because you were not part of a discussion and then the Slack thread develops over 50 messages and you probably will never see that. So this is a great place to hide something that you have been trying to discuss, but it's not a great way to share information. So Slack is not the place for that. Um, and generally, we would assume that Slack messages are ephemeral. So whatever happens on Slack, if you don't see it, it's probably not that relevant unless it was a direct message probably or a direct ping. Probably you get an email for that as well anyway. Um, otherwise, if you're on vacation and you don't read your Slack messages, that's fine. Nobody can keep up with those. Um, don't spend all your time on that. Um, 
to make Slack more efficient, this is one of the more concrete tips or communication things to do is to avoid naked pings. If you don't know what a naked ping is, don't search it on Google because it will bring weird results. I tried it out to find the link. Um, it's kind of an older concept or a well-known concept over time. A naked ping is basically pinging somebody without adding any relevant information. It's like writing to somebody who's like, like, hey, or hey, I have a question. Rather than writing the question immediately because you will basically save one round trip if you would do that. So if you say, hey, I have this question, and then you write out your question, and then the other person, once they see the message, they can respond to that. If you just write, hey, or hey, I have a question, the other person will need to write, hey, so what is your question? And you basically wasted a full round trip and probably broke somebody out of whatever they were doing, and then you're broken out of whatever you're doing to write the actual question. Don't do those naked things. Just write what you want immediately. Be nice to each other and write hey or thank you and all of the right things around that but include the relevant message right away and don't just do these naked pings um, because they're not helping anybody okay i think timing wise we're at half the hour already so i will try to more or less wrap this up now one thing to always remember is we're all home and this is not normal even though at Elastic we have been working from home or from anywhere for years, this is still kind of a weird situation for us. For example, hello Alex. Alex normally doesn't have his daughter at home all day long, so he's not taking care of her uh, during working hours normally. So this is a special challenge that he and probably many others have to fight. People are also sick or just anxious, or also maybe your IT systems are not prepared for working from home. So the current state is not normal. Don't be discouraged if this is not working out exactly the way you expected it to be or if you have bad days. Those happen. Working from home is a learning experience and especially if not prepared properly and under di in different time or difficult times, it is an extra challenge. So don't be discouraged by that. And don't give working from home a bad reputation just because it's hard to get started now or your systems are not prepared for that because if done properly, it can work very well. But if you're just thrown into it under bad circumstances, it might seem like a pretty bad thing. The other thing to always remember is empathy. And that is especially important if you don't see people in your office, but everybody is working from home, is don't assume that somebody else is doing something bad on purpose or out of malice. It's sometimes very easy to read some code and to say like, hey, this doesn't make any sense and the other person is stupid or they, they don't know anything. Probably somebody had some reason or based on the information they had, they made the specific decision. So it's important to actually take that step back and think like, okay, they probably did everything in the best interest or to their best knowledge and abilities they have. Let's talk this over. Why is this not the way I expect it to be? Or if somebody doesn't make a call, don't assume, well, they're lazy and they're watching Netflix on the car couch. Probably they're kind of, I don't know, minding their kids. So they don't run Amok around the house and that's why they're not on a call. Or they made some decision to not join the call for some good reason. Simon, who is one of our co-founders and the tech lead of Elasticsearch, he always says like, if somebody misses a call, even the, the weekly sync where everybody is supposed to be there, they probably have a good reason not to be there. And I don't want to question that they're not there. Like I said in the very beginning, we're adults, we're responsible for our own outcomes and where things are moving. Assume that people are doing the right decisions and trade-offs here. They probably had a good reason for not being in a call, which doesn't excuse bad behavior and it probably won't work for everybody. But for most people, they will try their best and do the right thing. So don't assume that people are lazy just because you don't see them right now. If you want to get more information um, or more virtual meetups, we have started this EMEA virtual group now. We will be running, I would assume, weekly um, webinars for the time being since we cannot have in-person meetups. So to keep you entertained and also produce content from here onwards, we will just broadcast those at different hours. We're not really sure what is the best time for everybody, 
but we will try out different times and also share the videos afterwards so you can then join those. If you feel kind of lonely or want to chat about the problem, we have the Slack channel for Elastic now. And we also have a water cooler there. So if you're sitting at home and you want to share stupid gifts with somebody, join the water cooler and probably stay for the tech questions and just the community work. If you have specific technical questions, Discuss is still the best place for that. But if you want to have something more chatty, ephemera, Slack is probably a good place to do that. And while you're sitting at home, maybe you want to do a training. We have switched all our trainings to be virtual. And while it's often busy, many people are sitting at home now, not really knowing what to do with their time. We have the virtual training. So if you wanted to dive into some pieces of our software and wanted to do a training, now might be a good opportunity because you're at home anyway, you can just do the training now rather than wasting it on something else. Cool. That's pretty much it from my side. I think we managed pretty much in 30 minutes. Um, if you want to get the slides, I have the QR code or I think I have already also fetched the link. Let me share the link. If you want to get the, the slides again, I've just posted them here. And it's 11.35 or so. If you want to go off for lunch, now is your chance. Otherwise, we're also happy to answer any questions that you might have. If you have any questions. We're also happy to hear like what has worked for you or what hasn't worked for you. Or if you're just sitting at home desperate and want to, to learn how things are working out or not working out. Philip, is there anything for you that you still can't cope with after years of home office that is super, super hard? Super, super hard. So normally I, since I normally travel a lot, I get out. I'm not sure how it will be to actually stay at home all the time. There are some, some of the obvious tips that I've kind of skipped because many people will tell you if you, if you work from home, go to the gym in the morning or do sports regularly, which is probably tricky since at least my gym is closed now. Um, I think I'm still allowed to go out to run, which I plan to do every second day to go for a run on my own outside. But otherwise the options are right now a bit limited, which yeah, makes this, like I said, extra challenging. So the regular work from home experience, I think is a bit easier also because you can just meet friends in the evening over dinner. Um, right now, some of these options are not there. So let's see. Um, we hope since we have work from home that we are prepared, but it will probably be challenging for us as well. Or having your kids at home, right, Alex? Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, that's hopefully a temporary challenge over here. Um, but what Alexander was writing in the chat as well, like, that's the hardest thing for me after seven years of home office is disconnecting in the evening. Like, you go out of the room, but your head stays there while you're having dinner with your family. And that's just something, even after all the years, it's super hard for me to just really shut down. And it's a huge difference if you have a 30 minute subway ride compared to a 30 second walk in a different room. And I still haven't solved this one on my side. No, neither have I. I for me, I have mostly accepted it that, I don't know, maybe this is my approach. I'm fine with that at least for now. Yeah, regarding the small kid, to be honest, like if the kid cannot play by him or herself, there's not much you can do except waiting that they grow older. Like the little one on my right side is three and a half and she's just demanding permanent attention. Like being the only one in comparison to kindergarten just means there's not much I can do. Like this here works for an hour, but I absolutely know that I couldn't do a two hour webinar with her sitting next to me. And hopefully your manager or whoever is running your company understands that. That this is kind of like a special time and it's challenging for everybody. So like I said, empathy. Hopefully everybody is trying their best and making it through that together. Is there anything you may want to mention about like 
differences in development processes or anything like that when working distributed compared to when you went to an office? Hmm. Well, I, I think the, the distribution model, we picked it up from the open source side because everybody was already working from home and that's how you make decisions in a distributed fashion. Uh, so that's where we are coming from and that's why it's easy for us. In an office, it might be a bit harder also to keep like a product team that is making the decisions in the loop. Uh, though, for example, our product team is more supportive and cooperative than telling us what to do. I've seen that work out differently in other companies and there it might be a bit more challenging to keep that in balance. What are your main development tips, Alex? Yeah, I was just more thinking in, in terms of like Agile or Scrum or Kanban, whatever based processes where you have regular meetings every end days that are across time zones is something that gets really, really hard. And I think it's just super hard to adapt. And the main question here is if something like uh, sprint planning every two weeks, if half of your developers can't attend because of time zones is a problem. But if everyone is in the same time zones, I think you can just sort of transfer most of it over to your regular development process and just make it virtual and go from there. There's no need to change the whole development process. And I think most of us have probably been developing things um, more locally and in the same time zones. So it's not a problem. And if you've not, you've already been in this challenge anyway. And it's mainly a question of, can you make everything virtual? Yeah, I, I guess it makes sense to whatever your old process was to kind of model that kind of as closely as you can um, to home and then adapt from there on, but not change everything in one go because that might just create chaos and not get everybody aligned and on the same page. So keep what has been working for now and then try to make small changes and improvements for working from home, but don't start from scratch because probably you have your work culture and how things are expected to happen. So building on that will probably be an advantage.